I appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk a little bit about what's been going on at the national level uh, related to uh, the discovery or report of African swine fever. There we go. In uh, in or excuse me, in China. So, first off, uh, maybe up, me up here talking, but it's not me who did everything. Um, I want you guys to know that from the national perspective, all of our organizations support our National Pork Board, Pork Producers Council, um, American Association of Swine Veterinarians, and Swine Health Information Center. Um, we've been working hand in hand on these issues, um, doling out the responsibilities and, and moving forward, trying to do tangible things that provide value back to the industry. And so uh, just keep that in the back of your mind that I'm the lucky one got to talk about it. So one of the first things is risk reduction. Um, it's important that we look at all the avenues of risk. And as Dr. D was pointing out um, with the research that they've been doing, there's a new risk pathway that we have to consider. I'd encourage you uh, to go to our booth here um, at uh, the checkoff booth. Um, we did have a meeting on September 5th with uh, USDA um, and FDA and the industry representatives. Uh, to chat about African swine fever, and we had a long list of things. One of those uh, on the list was a lot of questions about how we mitigate risk that's been brought up with feed and feed inputs. Um, you've probably seen the report, but on our, our web, or excuse me, on our table is a, a nice one pager of the preventative component of that discussion. I'm not going to hit on that today because I think it's been out and circulating. You may have read that. If you haven't, it's on our at our table and you can read that. I'm going to get more into some of the areas that, that haven't, we haven't publicized from that meeting. So hopefully you've seen uh, the work that was done. There were a lot of really smart experts on feed, uh, feed inputs that helped out put together the feed ingredient um, matrix there that uh, I don't think it matters which website you go to, but if you go pork.org, um, you can find that. It's that nice matrix of those questions that you should ask your feed company or folks who supply feed. The good thing about that is that's resulted in a bunch of, or at least my impression, is a bunch of the feed companies have started circulating around information that helps increase the transparency of the process that goes through when things are processed in another country and brought over here um, as a feed input. So. Um, that's on our website as well. Uh, I think that was a pretty valuable thing that was put together. And when you look at the risk that we have here in the country, there's multiple ways that people come to the United States. And so we recognize, you know, from the standpoint of you've got people who travel, who know nothing about agriculture, who, as previous speakers spoke about, go to a country, find some great product they think is awesome, and then bring it back home, and then conveniently forget to check on the, on the Ag Customs box that they're carrying a meat or meat product. And uh, so when you start thinking about that pathway, that's a little scary, but most of those people tend to live, live in town. Um, but then you have folks um, that work in the industry that are traveling, kids in 4-H, um, church groups in rural areas that go and do work in these countries, building um, lots of housing and things like that. Um, you know, and they don't know, necessarily know any better. And so one of the things that we thought, and we've done this a, a few years ago, is let's, let's look at how do we reduce risk um, for bringing anything back. I mean, PED taught me we don't want anything in this country. I don't really care if it's regulatory or non-regulatory. If it, we're naive for it, I don't want it. And so we do have at our website and Schick's website as well, just traveler biosecurity. What are the basics? Um, or if you're hosting international visitors, what are the basics on the, the biosecurity side? Now, obviously, this was done before ASF. And so as of right now, you've got to ask yourself the question, do you even want to be hosting international visitors until you have a better understanding of what's going on in countries like where there's uncontrolled um, foreign animal diseases moving around? Um, pass this by a couple of experts in the industry, and we're going to start working on uh, a more adaptive one for those people who actually go over and work with those animals. Um, I know a lot of veterinarians have protocols on their consultant side, um, but there needs to be resources for those non-veterinary folks that also go over and do work with these, uh, with these countries and the animals in those countries. During the meeting, we had a discussion about legal imports. I'll preface this by saying everybody in this room can probably tell me a story about the time that they went through customs and checked every box and they were waved right through. 
Those are things that when we hear about, we actually have a method to communicate with Customs and Border Protection to help stop those things from occurring. But they do do a lot of good work um, in trying to keep things out of this country um, through the normal practices and processes that are in place. Um, although in those discussions with the USDA, USDA has reached out to Customs and Border Protection and basically said, hey, please elevate China to a list that we can do some more targeted type interdictions, make sure that, as you saw those great pictures of, of sandwiches and products, that, that sandwich delivery system, um, you know, how do we catch those things? That one day, um, I think it was this morning, Dr. Frecking's one day poll from the uh, Ag Customs in Chicago, you can repeat that in every single airport across the country that takes international travelers in. You go down to Miami, you go um, out to Newark, same deal. There's a lot of food that's coming in here. Um, and so on the legal side, asking them to step up the game, and, and we think that USDA has done a nice job of reaching out and working with Customs and Border Protection to do that. There's my picture from Miami when we take uh, producers down there. And I tell you what, from the standpoint, um, talking to Customs and Border Protection, the Beagle Brigade is probably one of the best tools we've got for interdiction at the airport. These guys, these little dogs are amazing. And they're like me, they're food motivated. So, yeah. <laughs> um, they do lots of little tests. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll put meat in a bag and then um, hide that amongst other bags and then let those dogs loose and the producers are all standing there and going, that's pretty impressive. Um, but you may not know that in these ethnic markets, so a lot of this stuff that's coming in illegal, there's two illegal types. There's the type, it's a traveler who didn't know any better, and then there's the people that are deliberately trying to bring a product to put into an ethnic market in a big city or a larger city. So there's actually an interdiction unit that does go into those stores and look for illegal product, and they also capture a lot of things. But these are things that USDA, again, said that they will be working with Customs and Border Protection to elevate that level of awareness to try to make sure we're working on interdictions coming not just from China. China's a big, big deal for ASF, but it's been in Russia, it's been in a lot of other countries. So we want to make sure that we're targeting the right, right flights and the right bags. The reason is because of this, and it might be hard at the back of uh, the room but we as an industry have a challenge, and that challenge is that some states still allow the feeding of garbage, uh, meat containing plate waste. Um, the Swine Health Protection Act is the state of co uh, federal code that actually regulates that, so people have to be registered. Um, they have to cook that garbage to 212 degrees for 30 minutes, constant agitation. They also have a bunch of other um, policies and procedures they have to follow. But when you look at that's a 55-gallon drum, over top, held up by cinder blocks, with wood underneath, and that guy's got to stoke that thing to get that garbage up to 212 for 30 minutes. And so when you start seeing, well, if there's a failure on the cook side, and now we go to the feed side, and look at that beautiful girl just standing right out there, ready to eat. This is one of those pathways that I worry about the most for how we potentially get any of the foreign animal disease back in the United States is feeding of garbage. And so that's a conversation that we learned that at the federal level, uh, we learned that they didn't feel they had the regulatory authority to affect that, and it becomes a state-to-state -state issue. So um, if you take a look at this slide here, this is the most recent from the Swine Health Information, or sorry, excuse me, from USDA's website uh, for the Swine Health Protection Act. And uh, this gives you a nice pictorial representation. The yellow states permit garbage feeding, regulated garbage feeding, and the blue states have outlawed it. Now real quick, I'm gonna flash over to the feral swine map in the United States. I'm gonna go back, back, back. All right, so what states are feeding garbage and there's a lot of feral pigs there? Yep. So I really worry about that as our pathway in that if we have problems, somebody not getting time temperature, You've got feral swine. If I go back to this picture here, I'm pretty sure if there was a wild boar around there, he could get in there, right? So that's what I worry about. It's, that's how the slow burn, I think, of ASF could occur here in the United States if somebody's out of compliance with their garbage feeding or feeding illegally. That happens as well. But the states look for those folks too. That Swine Health Protection Act and the work that the state does to enforce it is vitally important. So there is a plan for African swine fever. It's a strategy. You can go to USDA's FAD prep website. It is available. It's not top secret. 
Um, if you don't want to read through that, you can read through our foreign animal disease preparation tech checklist that we had put together a few years ago. Um, this is a real easy to follow checklist for a producer just to try to raise their level of preparedness for their production site or for people that they're working with. It's a shorter, it's, it doesn't mirror, it mirrors the plan in that it helps pick out those things that you really need to focus on. The thing to remember with ASF is the state and the federal regulators are in charge. Industry plays a supportive role. For us to have a successful response, we have to be prepared to provide information to the state animal health officials in a way that's easily digestible for them to make decisions. So the first thing, and this is so simple and everybody laughs about it a little bit, um, if we're not, if we don't have premises ID numbers, valid premises ID numbers for our sites, and we're not using that information to connect our laboratory data and our movement data and other pieces of data that we would need just for business practice, then we've lost the game. If we hope to regionalize or if we hope to compartmentalize, if we don't have this valid site identifier for every site that has pigs, and I'm talking the site that has pigs, I'm not talking about the feed mill or the office, I'm talking about the site, then we're behind the eight ball and we're not going to respond very fast. So I would encourage you, we have uh, the ability for you to go to the pork.org and validate your prem IDs, print barcodes. Um, you can do it as a batch upload at 100 premises at a time or individually. What it does is it compares the prem against the actual schema to say, yep, that's indeed allocated as a, the right seven character alphanumeric. And after that, it returns a street address. If you compare the street address to your records, and remember your clients and yourselves are the most authoritative source on active farms and locations, if you compare those two, ours pulls out of the national repository and they match up great. If they don't match up, you need to work with your state animal health official to get that record in their database aligned with your record. That way the databases stay accurate. So I'd encourage everybody to go back to their home state or states that they work in, work with their producers or within their system to make sure their premises are valid, and then work with the state animal health official to make sure their data is updated with that. That's going to be a big, big thing for us if we need to have it or if we end up with an outbreak. One other thing that USDA told us is that we're going to have a large functional exercise to kind of test the ASF response plan. So we're kind of working on what that's going to look like, where that's going to be, who that's going to include. Right now we have assurances it will also include uh, Canada and Mexico because, as we pointed out today, we're all kind of on the same hemisphere and the same boat here if we get a, a, a foreign animal disease. So, um, But one other thing that you can do um, in your state is work with your state animal health officials to have an exercise. A lot of our state pork associations have done that, reached out to the state veterinarian. We have a tool at National Pork Board where we can come in and do a day-long program um, and simulate whatever animal disease outbreak you want to do. Um, I think the states that have done it have found it valuable, but you know we can do our own exercises with our state officials in the interim while we're working on the larger exercise. Just know that's a resource and something that um, you guys can participate in to help the level of preparedness. I like the, uh, the first presentation about, hey, get familiar with the foreign animal diseases like ASF. One of the challenges that USDA told us in this meeting was that we had only had two foreign animal disease investigations for case-compatible lesions for either CSF or ASF last year. And we've done hundreds for vesicular disease. Why? We've got Seneca floating around. But when you think about it, you see pigs with case-compatible lesions to ASF probably on a daily basis. But we don't report them anymore. And I'll talk about that in just a second when we talk surveillance. Um, one thing that we have that we want to make sure is that your producers at the slat level, the workers know what ASF looks like. Our push packs are available. We've got 25,000 of those things. We'll drop ship them, mail them, whatever you want. But we want one in every barn. Um, we've seen a lot of uptake, but this is something that we've been working hard on for the awareness side of things. You can go to our web page as well. This is the updated. Everything that's new and updated is on our web page at pork.org backslash FAD. Um, but you can go to SHIC as well. You can look at everybody, uh, ASV um, and PPC. We're all, we've got the information. Um, so. so we have an active surveillance program for classical swine fever, and it's based on tonsil. I think everybody understands that. In our meeting with USDA, our discussions were then, well, is it time for an active surveillance program for ASF? We've been asking for an active surveillance program for a while. There was even a pilot done. It was based on the CSF program. 
It showed uh, what was good, what was bad, what needed to be fixed, but it was never carried out due to lack of funding for that particular surveillance stream. So um, in that meeting got a commitment to really look at bringing back online an active surveillance program. The, the challenge is, is that um, we've got to figure out some better modes for sampling. Tonsil, for our response standpoint, if we're going to surge to try to do ASF surveillance in an outbreak, it's a horrible sample for surge capacity. What the labs are approved for right now, and the non labs, are um, whole blood, so unless you've got a bunch of tubes sitting around for that, um, we'd have to find a supply in a short period of time. Um, one thing that I keep getting asked about is when are we going to get oral fluids approved for uh, an emergency response for the foreign animal diseases. Um, the positive cohort study, according to USDA, that we learned at this meeting should be done um, next year. Um, I think they said, I can't remember if it was February or a little bit later. Don't quote me on that. Um, but at that point, then, we would, uh, they have gone through the process to validate oral fluids for FMD, CSF, and ASF for use in an outbreak scenario for surveillance purposes. Um, we also talked to them a little bit about, all right, well, whole blood's not a good surge sample, neither is tonsil. Hey, let's look at some other things as well that we could put into our surveillance program as we're talking about it. Um, you know, when you talk to the diagnostic lab, spleen usually comes with every package. So, hey, why not validate the test that USDA uses for spleen? So we got into those conversations, gotten some traction there. Um, some other things need to be done about, you know, kind of really looking at the sick pig case definition if you're going to do an active surveillance program. But we got a commitment from USDA to move forward on that, so that's a good thing. A couple of things I want to talk about with disease control. Um, you know, when you assume when the state gets African swine fever, uh, they're going to set up a disease control area, and if you're unlucky and you fall within that zone, the, the control area, there's a stop movement, and you're not going to be moving. And all production sites will be affected with, with pigs, and it's going to be really hard-pressed to get movement started up again until state animal health officials have a good feeling for what's in that zone, who's there, where they're at, and what their disease status is. And that takes time. And so um, a couple of things that I need you guys to think about when we talk about response. Unfortunately, with ASF, there is no vaccine. So with CSF and FMD, we've got an opportunity for vaccine to help. It might not be able there to help early. It may be in small enough you know, dosages that it doesn't do much early, but at least we got a vaccine. We got a couple vaccines. When it comes to ASF, our only tool is stop movements, biosecurity, depopulation, and disposal. So I don't know if you've ever uh, been to North Carolina's website, but they've got an actual nice website dedicated to uh, emergency programs uh, to, related to mass depop. They got some nice planning tools there. Um, it's worth a look. They've got a nice calculator for the amount of CO2 if you're going to use CO2, and they've got a couple of different designs for um, make two uh, uh, facilities to try to carry out uh, humane euthanasia depopulation using CO2. Just want to bring that to your attention. Some people have been asking me for stuff like that. So um, the one thing that really scares me about ASF is um, what we're going to do in a situation where we do have only a depopulation as, a, as an option. And so it's going to come down to managing that control area. The state vet's going to have to take a look at that control area and use some pretty interesting strategies, maybe try to reduce the amount of animals that need to be euthanized. And that's one of those things that we've been trying to focus on. If we're in an area and there's a lot of finishers that are ready to go to harvest, if we can get in there and get a look at them or get a test on them that would demonstrate that they don't have it, you know, could we move those to a harvest facility and get those out of harm's way while keeping that pork chop into the food supply? Um, you know, it's a lot easier to do depop on smaller animals. It's less mass. A little bit easier to do the euthanasia on that using CO2 versus a 600-pound sow. You know, so what are those things that we can do in a control area that will help reduce our need to depop from the standpoint of doing other things with animals that we can quickly ascertain might be negative? Disposal is another thing. The, I'll tell you this in the, my discussions with state animal health officials. Their first option for disposal is to do it somewhere as close to the site as possible. A bunch of you will laugh because you may have a barn that's sitting on a piece of land that you can't do anything disposal. And so then you have to go to the next. So think of it, all, all incidents start local and end local, all outbreaks. So you got to think that way in your planning. So what can I do on site? All right, then what can I do regionally? And then what can I do at the state level? And then what happens to happen nationally? Um, I've been here. I've been on lucky to been on a couple calls with some state animal health officials and some disposal folks, and you know there's a lot of openness to considering composting. 
and using that as a way to get, at least get these animals into a situation where you can knock down viral load in the carcass. You know, a lot of you are smarter on composting than I am. If a properly done pile, you're going to get up in some pretty good temperatures and times that will help knock viral load down. That's a good thing. There's some cool tools out there. I don't know if you've seen some of these retrofitted tub grinders where hey, you, it's just like one of those commercials with a ninja blender. And here goes a, here goes a whole Amish horse and a bale, and pfft, that's what you get right there. And so I was showing that to some uh, veterinarians in North Carolina, and I'm pretty sure I think they might be getting some of those, uh, some of that, uh, that uh, particular device there. The other option that you know states have tend to have if they've got a lot of black dirt like Iowa is, is disposal or burial. Neither of those are something you really want to do, but those are things that when you're looking at planning and preparedness, you have to start those discussions with your state vet now. Is what are we going to do with these carcasses and how are we going to do that? Who in my state is in charge of this? Horse trading. So another thing I want you guys to think about, and I said everything starts local. So just assume the day that we have ASF, you're stuck. You can't go anywhere. All right, so what can you do in your region when you've got pigs that need to move? How do you work with other production systems if they have an empty barn? How can I put my piglets there for a little bit while we're trying to sort things out? Because I think that's going to happen. If you fall into a control area, I guarantee it's going to happen. It will wrap up more people without the disease than with the disease. But you guys are going to have to move something somewhere. You might have fat hogs that need to go to a packing plant, but you don't have a contract with the closest packing plant. How do we work through that? Or I've got a bunch of pigs moving out of this, this south farm here. I just need a place to put them for a little bit while we're trying to figure out what's going on. How do you work with the people in your region to be able to do that kind of horse trading? If you can't do it locally, what can we do regionally? Think about this. There may be a control area in a state that exports pigs to the Midwest, and the state vet may stand there and go, I think that we have this thing contained to two counties. If you've worked with state vets, you know that they have some autonomy in what they want to do. They may have pressure on them that says you're not taking anything from North Carolina or anything from Oklahoma. Then what do you do if you can't move out of the state? How do you work well and play nice with the folks that are in your state? How do you basically protect the welfare of those pigs while trying to figure out options for business continuity. Because early on, it's going to take some time to start permitting movements. Again, these are discussions you need to have within your groups, within your friends in a zone or, or a region, and then going and visiting with the state veterinarian and talking about these because they're going to, they're going to want some ideas in an outbreak situation, and I know if you put people in this room together to come up with a solution to a problem, some constraints, you're going to get some real positive results from that. I already hit that slide, I forgot to take that out. The last thing I want to talk about is, so the industry has a ton of information that a state animal health official can use, and they need that information almost instantaneously. And today, the way that that information would be delivered um, and combined with other data sources, it'd be a bit clunky. There's information in state databases, federal databases, industry databases, academic or the D-Labs databases, all this great data that's going to help us in an outbreak. And challenges is it's really hard to get to and put together um, and put together in some way that's meaningful for the state animal health official. If we have a problem with doing that, we're going to have a problem with business continuity because the state vet needs as much information. Well, they don't need every bit of information. I know state vets have said they were buried in information. They need the right information, and they need it delivered in a way that's easy to, under, or easy to digest and make decisions. So first, I don't think, I think everybody knows that the Secure Pork Supply Plan has been completed, and the Secure Pork Supply website is available at securepork.org where you can go and go through the... Uh, steps for um, getting all your ducks in a row to be um, basically compliant with the program standards. And that's a good thing. So, you know, worst case scenario, we have ASF or CSF or FMD tomorrow. This exists. These are things that the state vet will be looking at in order to think when they start thinking about permitting movements. But one thing that we've been working on at National Pork Board is the development of a database and dashboard system calling AgView. I do it, this is the way I describe it. So um, pork producers, when they put together the information that's needed for a state vet are basically building puzzle pieces, right? And so in an outbreak, I can just hand those puzzle pieces over to the state animal health official and then they have to have somebody build a picture to determine whether I can move. 
I could also just build a database where people could stuff information in there, and that's me handing them a puzzle box with the pieces in it. They have the picture, but they still need somebody to build that picture. What we need is the ability to just show the picture to the state veterinarian to verify all the pieces are in there. And so that's what this system is being designed to do. Uh, it is a database and dashboard that would take the relevant bits of data and information that and uh, producers would derive from the program standards and be able to deliver that to the animal health official in a way that can be visualized and easily digested for decision making. It's an eight and a half million dollar project. We're in the first year of it, working with serious computer solutions. Minimum viable product for the ag system will be available February 2019, with an enhanced version coming in February 2020, or yeah, 2020. Um, and uh, out of respect for time, I'll just stop there, and that's all I got for you guys. <laughs>